It's Obsidian October, and this year we're going to be critiquing your plugins. We're looking at some existing plugins, learning what they do, checking out their overall design, and then diving into the code together. First up, Obligator. Let's jump into it and install Obligator from Obsidian's Community Plugin Directory. In this plugin, the user interface is almost entirely within the Settings tab. So let's go ahead and click Options. Immediately, I'm noticing some issues. The screen doesn't quite feel like part of Obsidian. The team at Obsidian actually publishes a guide on how a plugin Settings tab should look and feel in order to be uniform with the rest of the app. So I recommend that all plugin developers actually take a look through this guide as it provides some nice rules to follow, as well as practical general advice. There will be a link in the description below. Let's make our way through these rules and see how they apply to Obligator. First, plugins should avoid section headings like basic settings. This text is usually redundant and just takes up screen real estate. So let's get rid of it. This is a good time to switch over to the code. I have the project set up in Visual Studio Code and I'm taking a look at the Obligator setting tab. The plugin author has done a great job of keeping the code clean and well documented, so it'll be easy for us to make some changes. Let's hop into the setting tab display function, and we can see right here, we're adding an H1 tag to the container, and the text is basic settings, so let's just get rid of that. Let's save and switch back over to Obsidian. And now that first heading has been removed. Next, we already know we're looking at the settings tab, so there's no need to include the word settings everywhere. Let's go ahead and remove that. And now we just say archive and advanced. Last but not least, let's get rid of those massive headings. So archive and advanced, these are created using HTML H1 tags. But if you look at the other headings used throughout the app, like if I go to editor and I see display, behavior, advanced, the text here is much smaller and has a slightly different text treatment. Plugins can copy this exact same text treatment using a method provided in the Obsidian API. So let's jump back into the code. So instead of using this create element function, we are going to actually create a new setting, set the name to archive, but there's one difference between a setting and a setting heading, and we have a set heading function. It doesn't take any arguments, and that's it. So we can get rid of this, and we have our new setting archive set heading, and while we're here, Let's do the same thing for advanced. So let's get rid of this advanced, and instead we have advanced. So let's save, and let's jump back into Obsidian. And now you can see archive and advanced have the same text treatment used throughout the other settings in the app. That takes care of the layout issues, but let's go through the settings themselves and make sure that they make sense and are easy to follow. So first, I think we should move these two settings, initial heading and terminal heading, so they appear right after the template file setting. That'll make it more clear that the two settings are related. So jumping back into the code, let's find where those two settings are defined. And let's cut them and paste them right after the template file setting. Switching back into Obsidian, we now see that the initial heading and terminal heading settings show up right after the template file. Now, I think the more important thing we need to do is I think we should hide these two settings until there's a template file that's configured. So jumping back into the code, let's see how the template path is configured. It looks like the value is saved to this template path variable on the settings object. So what we can do is 
in directly in this display function. Let's say if the plugin settings template path exists. So let's take these two settings and paste them directly in the if statement. Now, only if there's a template path will that will we try to fetch the headings and then display these two settings. But that's not the only change we need to make for this to work as we expect. What we need to do is when the template path, which is here, is saved, so it's saved in the onChange function, when the template path is saved, we want to make sure that we always refresh the screen. So currently there's a check that the path that's set is a file, and then we refresh the list of headings. And instead, we actually want to make sure that the display function is always called, including if you're updating the template and it's not a file, or there's no template file configured. Now let's jump back into Obsidian to see what those changes look like. Immediately, this screen looks a lot simpler. We see that these first four settings now are almost identical to the daily notes settings, and there's no initial or terminal headings configured. Why don't we go ahead and configure a template file? I have a test file here called Butter Chicken, and as soon as I select it from the dropdown, the initial heading and terminal heading options now appear, and they show these dropdowns that include all of the headings in my note. If I go ahead and clear the template file, we see that those two settings are immediately hidden from the settings page. Let's keep moving. There's one more thing I want to talk about on the settings page, and it's regarding the advanced settings section. Let's take a look at these two settings in particular. Delete empty headings and don't delete headings from template. They're both toggles and they're both defaulted to on. This is a good opportunity to talk about good setting design. First, what's good and bad about this design? I think the setting names are very descriptive. I think it's they're clear, concise sentences that just from the setting name alone, I know whether or not I might want to change those settings. The description then goes into further detail. But there's something about the wording of these settings in particular that's confusing. The first setting, delete empty headings, is a toggle where on means delete. And then the second setting, don't delete headings from template, where on means don't delete. For toggles, I think a good rule of thumb is to always have them be worded in the affirmative, meaning that on always corresponds to the action that may or may not be performed. For these settings in particular, there's a couple ways we can fix this. The first is to just take this second setting, don't delete headings from template, and flip it around. Instead, we would rename it to delete headings from template, and we would just invert the value of the toggle. The second option is to change the action that's being performed. So without making any changes to the actual code, we could rename this setting from don't delete headings from template to preserve headings from template, where the action is no longer delete, but the action is inverted to being preserve. Let's jump back into the editor and make those code changes. Now that we've reviewed the settings, let's move on to the plugin code itself. So right off the bat, I'm noticing that the actual plugin code, which is this plugin class, is rather simple. Most of the logic is happening inside the onload function. More specifically, all of it is hidden inside this run obligator function. So let's just take a look to see what's being performed inside onload. First, we're loading the settings from disk. Then we're defining a ribbon icon. The ribbon icon will open today's daily note. Then there's a corresponding action that's being defined, also called open today's note. One suggestion right there, I would suggest maybe having the name of open today's obligator note and open today's note. 
these could be the same. There's no need for these to be different. And then finally, I'm seeing this on layout ready callback. It's only running when run on startup is set to true. So I really don't have too much feedback about that general structure. Everything here seems pretty good. I might suggest renaming run obligator to something a bit more specific, like open today's note. But otherwise, everything here looks pretty good. So let's look under the hood and open up this run obligator function. The code here, I'm already pretty impressed to see that this code is well documented. It seems to be pretty orderly in, in general, but I am noticing that there's a lot happening here. So let's work our way through this function to see what's happening. Step one, it's validating that all the settings are correct and it initializes some basic values that we'll need later. This is a very good step one. I think a lot of times when I review plugins, I notice that there isn't as much validation of the settings as I would expect because settings are loaded from disk. So there's a couple ways in which the values might have either been corrupted or they might not be what the plugin is expecting. So I think it's always a good idea to validate anything coming from the settings object. So first we're just checking for empty values for the note path. And if it's null or an empty string, we're displaying a notice and we're aborting immediately. One suggestion I would make, if this code is executing on startup, we're displaying a notice but this doesn't give any context about what plugin is causing this notice to appear. So one easy suggestion I would make is just prefix that notice with your plugin name. That'll help users debugging down the line, and it also give users the ability to make that change without having to guess what, what plugin might be displaying this. So let's go ahead and just make that change to all of these notices here. Next, we're validating that the note folder exists. We're using get abstract file by path, and we're normalizing the path that was, that's in settings. This is the correct API to be checking for file or folder existence. In newer versions of Obsidian, there are two new helper functions on the vault object called get file by path and get folder by path. These do the same thing as get abstract file by path under the hood, but they also validate for the proper type so they check if it's a T file or a T folder that's returned. Because those are only available on newer versions of Obsidian, I wouldn't necessarily advocate for the switch to, to use those newer functions, but they are available and a little bit easier to use for new plugin developers who don't necessarily understand what an abstract file is. Next, we're validating the settings for initial and terminal. A couple things are happening here. We're checking for undefined or null. And then if they are, we're trying to set a new initial value to empty string. What I don't like about this is that we're always calling save settings no matter what here. I would recommend instead changing this so that we only call save settings if one of these modifications actually happens. Next, we're checking that the initial heading appears in the template document before the terminal heading. What I don't like about this is we're actually parsing the document ourselves. I highly recommend avoiding this if possible. This is making a lot of assumptions about the Markdown document itself. There's a lot of edge cases involved in parsing Markdown, specifically around Markdown headings. There's a lot of different formats that a heading could appear in. So this kind of validation is very error prone. Instead, I would recommend using the metadata cache and using the heading text from the metadata cache. I'm not going to show that change now because it's likely a breaking change since the metadata cache stores headings in a slightly different format than this plugin is expecting. The last bit of feedback that I have is actually more of a feature request. So I think it might be nice for being able to open that daily note in a new tab. And in order to do that, we just need to make a modification to how this active leaf is chosen. Right now it's using get leaf, but get leaf accepts a few different arguments. And what we can do is we can, we can have it take in a pane type 
and we're going to have run obligator accept a pain type argument. Pain type is an enum that is returned from Obsidian, has a few different types, including tab, split, or window. Um, the other uh, argument that get leaf accepts is a boolean. So we're gonna we're gonna try and mirror the exact same type here. And because we also want to have a good default value, let's default this to false, which is the default for get leaf. And now leaf type is going to be passed in when we call get leaf. But let's go and make this change when we click on the ribbon icon, instead of just calling run obligator, we can make this into a thunk that then passes in a leaf type based on the click. So what we have here is we have a mouse event. So what we can do is we can convert that mouse event directly into a pain type by using the key map dot is mod event function. So we're going to then just run that through the is mod event function, and this will immediately convert it to a pain type, and that value is going to get passed directly to run, run obligator. On my keyboard and click, it opens the same daily note in a new tab. It's a very small change, but I think it's a really important one for plugins to consider how Obsidian users work and all of the different ways that the app can be used. We've just added a lot of power and flexibility to how the plugin can work and behave. All right, everyone, that concludes this week's plugin critique. A huge thank you to the Obligator plugin and its author, and thank you to everyone that submitted their plugin to be critiqued. I'll be doing more critiques throughout the month, so be sure to check back in on the channel. And if you're a plugin author, you can still submit your plugin for a chance to be critiqued. There's a link in the description below. Be sure to comment on the video what you'd like to see more of and follow along with more Obsidian October content on the company Discord.